again, I'm here with Andy from Snow Camps Europe. My name's Paul from Ski Instructor Academy, and we're here for another episode discussing all matters skiing. So what you got for us this time, Andy? So it's, um, we've had a question. <gasps> Um, a question. A question. We've had lo- we've had lots of questions, but this one was quite a good one because it's a, a it's always a hotly debated topic whenever it comes up, and it's people um, asking about skiing in poor visibility. Oh, that's a good one. Actually, so yeah. when you can hardly see in front of you, yes. and you get that dizziness feeling, and you don't know what's up and down, and you get a little bit sick, and it, basically they're asking what are our what are our pointers and things that they can do to help when the visibility goes bad. Yeah, it's the spar, isn't it? The spar in the bar. <laughs> yeah. The spar in the bar. <laughs> <laughs> Afternoon off. Afternoon off. Yeah. yeah, well, I think, I think the obvious one is, um, first of all, try to get rounded the easiest way, which is take tree line runs, take anywhere that allows you to have contrast to depth perception. So if you were like this backdrop here that you see on the television, if you're watching on YouTube, um, you can see the glacier. It's a, it's a glacier and a glacier has no trees. It makes it very, very difficult to know up from down when you get that real white out. Um, and a lot of people, you know, I remember skiing up there years and years back when I did teach, hearing people, you know, like screaming help in the background. Mm. Help, I'm lost. When they were just like 10 metres from from this, this the tea bar but they literally just got themselves disorientated because on a glacier it tends to be just white everything and there's a few cliffs and rocks but you don't have that tree line runs and it's so interesting you just get near to some trees or even some rocks or something and hey and of course the other way you cheat is you simply follow somebody else <laughs> because they will create depth perception again you know and that's why as an instructor at the front, um, from my side, I, I am useless. I must be the weakest person in the world when it comes to car sickness and things. I was, as a child, I was sick, everything. Whether it was car, hovercraft, boat, helicopter, airplane, everything, I was sick in. As soon as I'm not in control as the driver, I, I feel ill in any of those conditions. And even if I'm in a passenger seat car, I, I can't do it very long. It's Obviously, it's a balance problem. It's something in the ears. But... Weirdly enough, Andy, when I was skiing on the glacier and guiding in those really white out conditions and fog, I was fine. And yet the students behind would start feeling sick. And I'd think, why is it that I'm not feeling sick? And I put it down to the fact that as the front person, I was really hyper focused and mm-hmm. hyper concentrating on yeah. what the terrain was in the one meter I could see. So I think. If you're following somebody, it will make it easier because they create some idea of depth perception again. Is that not the case? So the first tip would be don't go high up. Stay anywhere that's narrower runs with tree lines, for example, or stay near the trees or near the lift system. Anywhere that creates a depth perception for you and that cheats your way through the day. Okay, good. Cool. Don't go off piste. Yeah, oh God, no, don't go up piece Do at all. Go Dear God, no. Um, okay, cool. A couple of good ones there. I um, I quite often put both of my poles onto the ground so I can feel what's up and what's down. So I'll ski with them trailing on the ground. Yeah, um, so you have four points of contact. Yeah, though. instead of just my feet. Um, and then I think that goes into it's obviously you need to be able to feel because if you can't see, mm. then you need to be able to feel. And um, what I quite often do with with groups of better skiers is we do a little bit of feeling exercises where we close our eyes Mm. so literally have them standing across the slope uh, as would be at the end of a turn Mm. get them to close their eyes and then release the skis let the skis go into the fall line and get them to complete a turn and what you'll normally find is if you say complete the turn and then get them to stop and count to three on the first attempt, nearly everybody will fall to the inside. Hmm. But the more and more you do it, the better they get at it, like anything. And by having their eyes closed, they, they have to use feeling. Hmm. And I try to talk to them about using their feet to feel. Um, and then I let them ski again without their eyes closed, hmm. but then start building it up. So we do one turn with our eyes closed, one turn with our eyes open. Um, and that seems to help. Um, yeah. So... And I think, so you're talking proprioception, kinesthetic skills, um, which are very important, which brings me to the point of when I was teaching a blind autistic person, 
Um, interestingly, I was shocked to see, and I, I, I taught this uh, guy from the beginning of his ski career, so literally he'd never skied before. But what was really interesting is from the first time he skied, he was centred. And normally people aren't centred. It's one of the, the mm-hmm. things that they find problematic. And clearly because he was blind, he just had that hypersensitivity. He had that hyper-awareness, um, fantastic proprioceptional awareness. And as a result, you know, obviously to him, fog didn't matter. <laughs> That's yeah, the one benefit. Yeah. You know, so um, yeah, it was it's interesting. And as the scheme career progressed and got faster and faster, parallel turns, you know, quicker, short turns and everything, it's amazing to see and be around people like that. But it proves how important or how much we rely on our eyes, our, mm-hmm. you know, our lesser, lesser students, if you like, rely on their eyes and how much the expert starts to rely more upon those feelings. So you saying drag the poles is just you saying now I've got like a, say, a set of stabilizers, but it's more about not using the pole as a, a contact to the ground hard, but rather a, a, a walking like a, I don't know how you would call it, like almost like a, a plumb line to the ground, just yep. dragging it lightly yep. across. Exactly. Yeah. to get some sensation of where you are in space mm-hmm. yeah yeah and then i think the other one if, if you are on the glacier and you you you're um you've not got the benefit of the trees is is you, you need to listen for the lifts mm-hmm. L- listen for the lift and then try and ski alongside the lift because mm-hmm. obviously the lift goes down or, or well the lift takes you walk goes up and goes back down <laughs> um and if you uh you can follow your you can follow literally the lift pylons Especially on the glacier with the two the two T bars in the middle. Um, so yeah, listen, and I think listen. ski ski runs that you know would be a good piece of advice and stick with it. Don't start exploring the mountain on a day like this. Find a run that works on a day like this and then just ski that run. If it's if it's got the best visibility, then why on earth would you want to go higher? You know, yeah. just stay where you are. But challenge yourself. Don't avoid a day like that because as you oh. pointed out that is where you become a good skier is when you're challenged and let's face it if you make relatively decent parallel turns normally down a blue or a red run your pole plant you're pretty good and then all of a sudden you find yourself falling to pieces just because it's a white out or you've got to question your technique at that point there's something not right you're not perhaps as good as you think and well yeah and i think don't don't be afraid <coughs> to go back you're not going to go bombing down the run doing short turns in zero visibility. Yeah. So go back to slow, long turns. If you're an intermediate skier, don't worry that you have to go back into a snowplow. I go back to a snowplow all the time when I get in Can't a pickle. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Well, one of the biggest skills ski instructors had, actually, and we see this a lot in the off-piste as well when you're first testing the train, is to use a plow parallel. Yep. It's it's often done, a plow parallel as a skill, just like we talked about side slipping and side stepping, side stepping you yep. were talking about the other day. Yep. It's interesting how important plow parallel is. And of course, nobody, and one of the things we know from Ski Instructor Academy is one of the hardest things and the most failed part of the exams is plow parallel because nobody quite understands what what's it for i don't need to do this i can parallel turn why should i plow parallel it doesn't make any sense yeah. but a, an advanced skier will use it sometimes for example let's hear in an off-piece section and you're not going to be able to build enough speed on the first turn to start making parallel turns down a steep bit of snow you would use that little side like that step out as an just a feeling because you, you know you're not going fast enough to create a parallel turn you wouldn't tr- the problem is, is sometimes people f- trying to force a parallel turn yeah. without having the right speed to be able to do it on a certain terrain so it's a great method in the in the in the snow i, I remember and this goes back to my first season and we were on the glacier and you took us down what is now black mamba Oh, yeah. And it was a it, pow- there, it was yeah. a powder morning. It, it used to be a ski route, which it was way better as a ski route than it is as a, a piste. And it had snowed, and you took you took us all down there, and and you said exactly that. You said, in powder, you need to find the base, and if it's steep, you can't just go straight line in it, do three little bounces, and then turn. So use a plow parallel because by putting that ski out, boof, pressure goes on it. You find the base. And then off we went down, mm-hmm. down a black mamba in deep powder. Yeah. Um, but um, and if there's somebody wants to know the difference between like a plow parallel and a parallel turn, the significant difference is is when you 
plow parallel, your center of mass stays within the base of support. Whereas if you imagine you were doing a parallel turn, your center of mass is crossing over the base of support. And therefore what Andy was saying there, it makes sense for you to have some security in difficult conditions that you're unsure about by keeping your center of mass over the top of your base of support yeah. and therefore it's a skill it's like sidestepping and side slipping yeah so don't don't feel bad if your skiing goes backwards when the visibility is bad because it happens to all it's of intelligent us. skiing yeah. it's not going backwards yeah. it's intelligent skiing yeah it's, yeah, it's thinking about but be aware that this is your opportunity to tune into your feet and it's your opportunity to realize that you haven't been tuning into your feet because the difference is, is after I'd skied for a number of years, I suddenly realised that whiteout conditions didn't bother me with the exception of being frustrated with the weather and thinking, oh, it's crap today. <laughs> but it did, doesn't matter. I can go at the top. I was at the top of the mountain the other day there with Julian and he was falling to bits and, you know, he was often losing me on the run and he was going, oh, should we go down? Like, you know, it's crap. <laughs> and I was going, well, Actually, I think it's quite good. The snow is really nice, but the visibility doesn't bother me. I, more what bothers me is crap snow. The feeling, yeah. It, you know what I mean? You know, I, yeah. I'd rather ski in bad visibility with lovely snow and nice powdery, you know, so, than, than ski in great visibility with those death cookies on the mountain and crunchy bits of ice all over the place. Yeah. That, that bothers me more than bad visibility because... As a good ski, you don't rely upon your eyes in the same way. Don't get me wrong, it's better with visibility, but you don't need it because, and not only that, let's face it, we know them runs. We've skied them thousands of times, you mm. know, so you do know where it drops and where you are in the mountain. You don't get lost. So I get that. But um, I think um, those tips are important, but the most important one is don't avoid it because I think it's an opportunity to improve. Yeah. Um how important are goggles in the scheme of things? Yeah, I mean, you know, if you're lucky enough to have a pair of Oakley prisms or something with the wonderful ability to um, enhance light. Um, I mean, some of those goggles are like, you put them on your eyes and it's like switching the lights on, isn't it? Like, it's like Jesus Christ, I'm going to burn my eyeballs out and there's a white out. Um, some goggles, you know, there's no doubt about it. The tools like that are important. Look at the day. I remember when um, Hersher was going down and they made a mistake with his um, goggles and the guy had put some, done something to it and it, it steamed up. That's what the <laughs> problem was his goggles steamed up as he went down the race course and you know they, they had this huge then obviously you wouldn't have seen it in england but in austria it's a big thing ski racing and they had this huge thing afterwards for days and days and they were discussing everything about goggles and everything about what this guy had done and the mistakes and this that the other they're important i mean don't get me wrong and they they, they literally change the lens of that goggles for every single you know degree of light that they're seeing at the mm. time before the race that they'll have a specific thing and don't get me wrong oakley's not the, the king of goggles you know i just mentioned their goggles at that time because they're renowned to be super good quality but this is not the time that you want some sort of like single you know you want a double anti-fog you want every physical and when it comes to the goggles be careful not to be touching them and you know doing weird things inside them because that really destroys yeah, the, the coating inside. yeah and I, I, that's where the biggest problem is often when you get these Fucky horrible days at the beginning of the season, the snow cannons are going and the stuff freezes on the front of your goggles and you put your hand across mm -hmm. to wipe it off and oop bang your goggles destroyed. But then again, that that's a great um that's a great opportunity. So if, if you've got a good visibility day, but you've just skied through a a, a cannon, mm. don't wipe that off your goggles. <laughs> Do a few turns, because again, with Practice. that with that um frozen fake snow on your on your goggles well the real the real reason is to take that snow off it's really important that you take your hand out your glove you warm the the, the melt goggle it. melt until it goes to water before you wipe it because you'll destroy your goggles in one sweep with that icy cruddy stuff on your goggles but goggles are important no doubt about it and um, you need a good pair um and you don't need to take the i know a lot of people take them off you know which is not going to really help you that that's just, you, know, you need a good pair of goggles so i would say that's highly unrecommended okay so tree line narrow yep listen for the lifts and then then you come on to the C word. Now, I hate using the C word, and I, I promised I wouldn't use it, but having core stability, having an awareness of connectivity is going to be really important. So this is the time where you come back to what was said in previous things, and when I do some of these physics and skiing um, on future videos, and I talk about connectivity, is be careful of the vertical. 
do not be making vertical up and down too much, but remain more connected to the snow. So imagine, I don't know, a, a scale of one to 10, 10 being maximum pressure, one being no pressure at all. Try and just maintain a sort of five. You can't do it because you have to release the edges and skis, but just try and maintain some connectivity, i.e. some flexion that is under tension of the ankle. Do not end up too much in a forward position, but at the same time remain centered so that um, you don't disconnect. The disconnection will enhance that sickly feeling almost because you're yeah. like on a boat going yeah. up and down. So remaining dynamically lower, and I'm being careful not to use the word crouch because I, I don't really like that word dynamically crouching even sounds still restrictive you want to be dynamically lower um your center of mass makes sense you know why why can kids go down the way they do for example mm. in that stupid plow position at four or five years old screaming down the mountain with them hanging back it's just because a center of mass is like so two low, inches yeah. from the floor so if you can create a lower center of mass that's not you just ending up in a sort of compressed position that just looks ridiculously contorted but at the same time not actively to releasing the ski from your foot so you feel the ground underneath you all the time that would be another thing and i would say andy ski a little bit two-footed rather than being completely unilateral mm -hmm. you know going from left to right which is traditional alpine skiing that's what you're supposed to do go from the outside to outside i would say here there's this cause for you to be a little bit not inside heavy but just being aware that you do have a second ski it's, it's there for a purpose. And certainly, that I wouldn't let that encourage me to widen my stance because people might say, oh, a wider stance might help. Well, I would argue no. I would still keep your stance fairly much under your shoulders at this level or narrower. Um, but stay connected. Don't go up and down. And remember the C word. Um, having some form of core stability tension throughout your spinal mechanics is going to give you that. And avoid over rotation which will start to happen in those conditions yeah for sure it does and i suppose going back to something we said on part two of the question and answers that we put out a week or so ago is again before you set off on that run mm. think about what you're about to do what do i need to do different how am i going to do it what's my goal where am i going to get to da, 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 da. just get yourself ready and yeah. then which brings you on to the last point i suppose on this is where andy says you know get yourself ready for the run this that the other and it's, it's then the visualization of this is actually a sunny day. This is a beautiful blue sky above <laughs> me. This is a sunny day. I know this piece and I'm going to smile and I'm going to get down there. I'm going to breathe. Uh, you know, I'm not going to tense up. I'm not going to be holding my breath like I'm holding in a fart from, you know, in church or something. Um, I'm going to I'm going to be really actively happy to be out in the air and skiing. And if you're with other people who are nervous, then take the lead, you know, get them close as possible behind you because you will greatly assist them rather than skiing down and looking up and waiting and tapping <laughs> your pole for them. Instead, bring them with you, slow yeah. yourself down, yeah. but bring them with you. And remember that speed is still very important in skiing, unfortunately, even in those difficult conditions, they are going to make their life miserable if they've already took a third or a half of the speed off that they usually have. They're going to have sore feet because they're going to be twisting like mad and all sorts to try and get the ski to turn. So that would be my advice uh, first. And um, I'm sure some of you will have some great tips for, mm -hmm. for skiing in bad snow. I mean, no doubt about it. And we would love to see them in the comments below. Educate us. Tell, tell us, us something. Tell us what you do when tell it gets something. zero visibility. Well, that was a brilliant one, that one. See you More on the next like one. that. See you on the next one. Bye for now.